Oh no, because I, I do. So it's normal, okay. Huh? So let's come to our last talk of our morning session. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce Petro with his talk, Recent Developments in Barnach Lettuce. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, thank you. So let me start uh, by thanking Amin, uh, the driving force behind uh, this conference and all the organizing committee for, for making it uh, possible. And of course, for the, for the invitation and for making us uh, enjoy, I'm really enjoying the conference uh, these days here and in this wonderful place. So, so again, thank you very much. Okay, so the well, I, I also have to thank uh, the cooperation grant from uh, CSIC, uh, my institution that has been uh, funding us uh, for last year and this year, and that's why we we have uh, the opportunity to, I mean, for us to visit uh, Tunisia and for Tunisian people to visit uh, Madrid, and I hope we we can continue with this uh, nice. Um, uh, relationship and okay so the topic of the lecture I, I want to focus on some aspects of uh, Banach lattice theory that uh, have been developed in the in the recent years and mainly because we have certain certainly new tools that were not available before and and well with, at least allows us to look at certain problems uh, maybe with a more hopeful uh, perspective uh, so okay Maybe it's not necessary to recall what is uh, a Banach lattice, but anyway, uh, for us, remember a Banach lattice is just a Banach space with a vector lattice structure and some connection between these two, which is given by these uh, seemingly looking, uh, seemingly, well, I mean, at least it, it, it looks innocent, it looks naive, but uh, all the interaction between the topology and the lattice structure is hidden in there, right? So, well, that's precisely the kind of thing that interests me. Uh, the, the, the relation between Banach space properties or geometrical properties and vector lattice or Banach lattice uh, properties which are related to the order, okay? And so I will be looking at, of course, operators which not only preserve the linear structure but also the lattice structure. So I will call them lattice homomorphisms. And well, I want to look at uh, certain properties which are very classically, uh, very, very classical and well known, which relate Banach space properties from a Banach lattice perspective. So, of course, all of this I'm going to discuss now, it's very classical and well known probably from most of you. So, one of the first properties I could uh, look at is uh, reflexivity, which is kind of a very important notion in, in Banach spaces. So, you know that. When you start with a Banach space, you can look at the dual Banach space, which is just the family or the space of linear and continuous functionals into the scalar field. And you can equip that with a natural norm. And well, if you iterate this process and you construct the dual of the dual, well, you can actually fit the original Banach space in a very canonical way inside uh, its second dual. And well, reflexivity is actually saying that this, uh, this, this map, this identification of the Banach space with the subspace of its second dual is actually uh, surjective, right? So that you can actually identify points in the second dual with points in your space in a very particular way. And reflexivity is, of course, also related to uh, weak topologies. So reflexive spaces are exactly those Banach spaces where the unit rule is a weakly compact set, which in particular tells us that this is a, an hereditary property, meaning that if I have a reflexive space and I look at any uh, close up space of it, that will be also uh, reflexive. So in particular, 
we could look at classical Banach spaces, Banach lattices as the sequence space C0 or L1, right? And these are, of course, non reflexive, as you know. Uh, well, these are related. What's the dual of L1? It's L infinity, and this is way bigger, right? It's non separable, and so on. And so none of these spaces is, is reflexive. So you cannot hope that these spaces can sit as closed subspaces inside a reflexive Banach space. Well, when you look at Banach lattices, that property of reflexivity is precisely characterized by this fact. I mean, the only obstruction, if you want, for a Banach, Banach lattice to be <laughs> reflexive is that it must contain C0 or L1 line somewhere, like a subspace, okay, as a closed subspace. And one can actually go a little bit further and, and prove that this is actually equivalent to having no sublattices, the reflexivity of a Banach lattice is actually equivalent to having no sublattices of the Banach lattice, which are, are lattice isomorphic to C0 or L1, okay? Which is now a purely Banach lattice property, right? And that I would be calling a Banach space property. I will try to use colors just to make things uh, clear, clear for me at least. Uh, one can, also consider other well-known properties also related to weak topologies like uh, weakly sequentially completeness, meaning that every weakly Cauchy sequence will have a weakly convergence of, uh, will be weakly convergent, sorry. And you can relate that in the Banach lattice situation to the absence of sub lattices isomorphic to C0 or subspaces. And there are many others, uh, many other notions. Um, some which can be considered partially as, or yeah, in some way as a local version of these properties are those related to type and cotype, uh, which one can define by using um, um, <clears throat> probability inequality, well, certain probability inequalities in a, in a Banach space, and which are, well, very well uh, studied and, well, also certainly sometimes quite technical. And in the Banach lattice situation, we have the notions of convexity and concavity that you might recall, but let me just write something on the blackboard. So we will say that a Banach, says, a Banach, a Banach lattice is the convex whenever you look at elements of this form and, and you can find some, uh, sorry, some estimates like this, okay? So you can control from above the norm of p-sums by the sum, the p-sum of the, of the norms. So that would be p-convex and convexity, p-convexity, finite, <clears throat> sorry, non-trivial convexity is related to non-trivial type. I mean, it's actually equivalent. Non-trivial cotype is related to non-trivial concavity. And well, one can study several uh, of the connections between these things. So I just wanted to mention this because certainly it's much more easy for relatively simpler to look at this kind of estimates than the ones arising in type and cotype, or at least formally. Okay, so uh, yeah, I want to focus on, as I said, on Banach space properties, or what's the relation between having uh, certain Banach lattice structures in, a sim in the same Banach space or things like that. So that's, uh, I I've, re I've written here a, a list of, of names of people who have been working in this for quite, well, uh, uh, I think since the 70s, yes, I guess, 60s, 70s, there's been a lot of, well, there's been a, a bunch of people working in these kind of questions. So how do you relate Banach lattice structures and Banach spaces? And so, well, maybe the first uh, observation is that, of course, not every Banach space carries a Banach lattice structure. Uh, Valentin and, and, and David already mentioned uh, this. So you have certain Banach spaces, which there's no way you can think of them as Banach lattices. They, they, they're not linearly isomorphic to uh, any Banach lattice for several reasons. So one, one, one maybe simple uh, example is James space. Uh, another more complicated, considerably more complicated family is that of uh, gauss moray spaces, or Italy in the composable spaces, which cannot be isomorphic to, to a Banach lattice. And on the other side of the spectrum, you could have 
Banach spaces, which have simultaneously different, or which can carry different lattice uh, structures, right? And the, maybe the simplest example would be Hilbert space, which you can think of it as the sequence space, the Hilbert space of sequences which are square uh, summable, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, whose squares are uh, summable and which are actually a, a Banach lattice, if you want an atomic Banach lattice, you have a family a sequence of atoms which generates the, the lattice. And on the other side, you could have Hilbert space of, I mean, L2, capital L2 of, of 0, 1, for instance, with Lebesgue measure. And these two spaces are linearly isometric, but of course, there's no way you can uh, find a, any atoms in here. So these two things cannot be, from the lattice point of view, isomorphic. However, uh, there is this uh, result by Abramovich and Boydashik from the 70s, uh, which uh, tells you that in some cases, you could have exactly one Banach lattice structure on, on certain Banach spaces, right? And this is the example of the space um, L1 of, sequ of, of some of all sequences. One can, the proof is not too complicated. Uh, I can at least sketch the idea. So imagine you start with a Banach lattice, which is linearly isomorphic, uh, sorry, to, to, to L1. So of course, because L1 doesn't contain any subspace isomorphic to C0, I can say the same thing about my Banach space X or my, my Banach lattice X, right? This tells me in particular that this space X, this, this Banach lattice X, if it's isomorphic to L1 necessarily must be order continuous, right? Because it has no copies of C0. And in particular, this, well, this is equivalent to saying that the order intervals are weakly compact, right? This is one of the many equivalences of order continuity that uh, many people uh, might remember. And because we are, ha we are looking at a Banach space, which has a very special property, which is called the Schur property, we know that in that space, any weakly compact set must actually be norm compact, okay? This is a consequence of the Schur property in L1. And then I learned that these order intervals that I knew they were weakly compact, they must be norm compact. And then from classical uh, known facts, this implies that the space must be atomic, right? This, this Banach lattice must be atomic with the order given by uh, an unconditional basis, if you want. And then uniqueness of the L1 basis uh, makes it, uh, it forces the space to be actually lattice isomorphic to L1, okay? And well, in general, one could ask the following uh, deliberately vague question of how many different, essentially different uh, lattice structures one could find in a given Banach space. So as I said, we have, it could be zero, <laughs> right? Uh, it could be, well, at least two. Well, in this case, actually you get infinitely many just by Add in atoms, for instance, the number of atoms will determine the lattice, um, um, the lattice type of the space. And in this case, we have one. But uh, are there other examples? Well, there are, but that's kind of work in progress to understand how many you could have on a general Banach space. Okay, uh, slightly related to this, but now instead of looking at global isomorphisms, I want to look at embeddings, okay? And I want to start by recalling the following classical and very useful result of May and Eva, uh, well, attributed to him at least, that if you have a Banach lattice which contains a subspace isomorphic to C0, then uh, necessarily you can find a sublattice isomorphic to C0. This is related to this notion of um, weakly sequentially completeness that I was mentioning in a previous slide. So I've used this theorem several, several, uh, several times uh, and, and it has helped me a lot. So uh, I, well, I think it's a very interesting theorem. Uh, one comment is that, of course, when I'm saying that C0 embeds in a linear way, I mean, when I say that C0 is a subspace of a Banach lattice, uh, this means that there must be another copy of C0 which lies as a sublattice. I mean, I'm not saying that every time I embed my subspace C0 into a Banach lattice, it has to be as a sublattice, right? It could be in a relatively 
um, I mean, in a completely crazy way, as, as far as the lattice structure is, is, is um, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as, as far as you could, you could take, uh, yeah, you could take many, many ways of embedding C0 in a Banach lattice, which are not uh, sub lattices. But this is telling you that if you can do it in a linear way, then necessarily there's somewhere in your Banach lattice where you can find a sub lattice isomorphic to C0. So for some time, uh, it was asked what other Banach lattices have this same property. Okay, which Banach lattices have the property that if you find a subspace somewhere in some Banach lattice, then necessarily you must find a sub lattice. Are there other examples? And well, there were some partial results in this direction by Lotz, Rosenthal, and, and Gusso, but, uh, and of course, Carlton also worked a lot in the case of capital L1, but, uh, you always need some conditions to, to, to make this work. Uh, extra conditions on the, on the, on the M Banach lattice you're embedding your subspace. And with full generality, it has, uh, it, it, we could prove that another very classical space, so the space of continuous functions on the unit interval, also has this property. Okay, every time you can, I mean, if you can find the subspace of a Banach lattice isomorphic to the space of continuous functions in zero one, then necessarily you can find an embedding which is uh, lattice homomorphism, right? So you can find a sub lattice of that Banach lattice which is also lattice isomorphic to C of zero one. Okay, and the proof, well, it has some, it has some technical part, but uh, apart from that, there are certainly some ingredients, some new ingredients uh, which were not available before and that certainly help us uh, prove this thing. Uh, so in particular, we use the notion of projectivity in Banach lattices, which was introduced by Ben de Pachter and Tony Wickstedt uh, a few years ago. And they actually proved that this space C of zero one is uh, actually projective as a Banach lattice. And this is related to the fact that you can extend um, lattice homomorphisms, or you can lift lattice homomorphisms to portions of Banach lattices. And, and well, that was kind of a useful tool uh, to prove this theorem. And another very important tool that we used, uh, that maybe this could be circumvented, but, but, but it was really helpful, is the existence of a universal, uh, separably universal Banach lattice. So there is this uh, construction of a space by uh, Leung, Lee, Oikber, and, and Tursi, who proved that the space of continuous functions on the Cantor set with values in capital L1, it's a separable Banach lattice, and every uh, separable Banach lattice embeds uh, lattice isometrically as a sub lattice of this guy. So that was kind of instrumental, but, but it helped us. Uh, and that was really, well, maybe, I don't know, 20, 2018 or something like that, 20, yeah, five years ago, something like that, I don't remember. Okay, so it took a while from 73 to 22, but uh, maybe as I'm saying, there, we have now some new tools that, that, that help, help us address these kind of questions. And well, one can go farther and ask, okay, what about other examples, right? Can you find other examples with this same property? Well, the first observation, Right? If I have a Banach, a Banach lattice with a similar property, I'm saying that suppose you have a Banach lattice with the property that every time it embeds linearly in a Banach lattice, then it must embed also uh, in a lattice way. Then this forces this lattice to be an AM space, right? Because every Banach lattice or every Banach space embeds in the space of continuous functions over the unit of the dual unit ball linearly and isometrically. So if I have this property that every time I have a linear embedding, I get a lattice embedding, then I must, my Banach lattice can be embedded into the, as a sub lattice of the space of continuous function. So, so this forces, I mean, this reduces quite uh, uh, dramatically the, the, the amount of Banach lattices that one uh, could hope for such a property. So of course, C0 has this property, C0 one has this property. 
And what we could do is that, at least in the separable setting, we could characterize those Banach lattices with this property, right? So uh, let's say, yeah, so, so, so these are the two properties I'm looking at. Uh, for separable Banach lattices, it is the same that you have this property that every, well, whenever you have a linear embedding, there is a lattice embedding. That's what I was saying before. And this is the same as saying that my Banach lattice must be a sub lattice, the space of continuous functions in zero one, okay? Uh, there, so you have many different uh, sub lattices with this property and well, and they, these are all, because C0 embeds there, it's a sub lattice. And yeah, several other things, but yes. However, this works for the separable situation, right? Because of course C01 is separable and it's universal uh, for separable Banach spaces. Now, if you go to a larger uh, density character, we actually don't know. So this is completely open. For us, we we don't even know if uh, well if you start with say you take a power of 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 zero one you take a product of zero one and uncountably many times that could be a, a natural candidate maybe but we were not able to check whether this is uh, I mean whether this satisfies a similar uh, result in a non-separable situation. Okay, um, so what's next? Well, let me check. My time. I have until what? 12.30, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, um, among the tools that I was mentioning before, uh, there is one which I have been particularly fond of, which is that of the free Banach lattice, of a Banach space. So, uh, let me briefly recall uh, what do we mean by this. So, yeah, uh, we were discussing this morning with Martin about the, well, how beneficial it is to speak about category theory or functors in this language. Uh, so, well, this has a, this has a clear uh, categorical flavor, but we can, I mean, I'm not an expert in, by far, in, in, in category theory. But, well, one can find certain analogies between these kind of objects and, and, and similar uh, objects with uh, similar free properties in other in other contexts. So this is kind. Of, I mean, I, I actually, I find this like inspiring rather than uh, uh, the way to develop a unified theory of, of free objects. But uh, anyway, so what is this thing? So what we are going to do is you start giving me your favorite Banach space, and I'm going to construct some Banach lattice, which is very well attached to it. Okay, in, in, in a very particular way. So I start with the Banach space. I'm calling Banach spaces E here. And the free Banach lattice generated by E is going to be, well, a Banach lattice, which is also equipped with the canonical uh, linear embedding, linear isometric embedding into the free Banach lattice, right? So I have a Banach space E sitting inside the free Banach lattice in some uh, linear way. And this embedding has the following uh, universal property. So every time I pick a Banach lattice X, right? I'm using X for as if they were the variables I'm working with, okay? That's why I'm not using X for Banach spaces as it's more usual in the Banach space uh, theory. So I have a Banach lattice X. I look at any operator between my original Banach space E and the Banach lattice X, right? By that, I mean a continuous linear operator. And the universal property tells me that I can lift, I can extend this operator, right? So this guy is sitting inside of the free Banach lattice, so I can extend it in a unique way to a lattice homomorphism, okay? So this is, I mean, this is a Banach space which a priori has no lattice structure, so I cannot speak about lattice homomorphisms from here, but it embeds in this larger guy, which is a Banach lattice, and, and, and it embeds in such a way that, well, that this happens, okay? And moreover, one can control the norm of this extension, right? So you can view this as an extension, you can view this as a commuting diagram, as you wish, right? Um, so, uh, of course, um, one might argue, uh, 
why such an object exists, right? Why such an object exists? Some other people might not argue that, but I, I, I was one of the people that was skeptical and why such a creature should, should exist? Why, why do you have some, an element like that? Well, well it does exist uh, for every Banach space, but maybe I should mention first, uh, this is based, actually uh, the, the first result in this line was uh, due to the Pachter and Wickstedt who proved uh, with a slightly different language that the free Banach lattice over the Banach space L1, L1 sequence space, L1 over any set, uh, actually exists. And motivated by that paper, we looked at, uh, at several developments. So jointly with Antonio Aviles and Jose Rodriguez, we could prove that this object really can be defined for any Banach lattice, well, sorry, for any Banach space E, not just uh, L1. And moreover, one can give us a certain, a more or less explicit description of it. And Enrique did that the other day, uh, more or less, and in, in, well, in a slightly more general situation, but um, yeah, that's the idea. And well, there have been other developments in this line. So Antonio Aviles and Jose Rodriguez Avellan in particular, proved and studied the free Banach lattice generated by a lattice. And by a lattice, I just mean here a set with lattice operation, so no linear uh, structure whatsoever. I mean, just a lattice, right, in the standard sense, like in the book of uh, uh, Birkhoff that was mentioned this morning. And, 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 and here, well, the universal property has to be, uh, I mean, things change, of course, I mean, now, this embedding delta that you have in this situation will be just a lattice em embedding, right? And, and then lattice morphisms will become linear lattice or morphisms in the extension and, and so on. Uh, actually, free Banach lattice over lattices, one can check that these are just certain renormings of spaces of continuous functions. So, well, or of sub lattices of space. So, certain AM spaces can be renormed. To be like that, to be to have this property. Uh, what else? Ah, yeah, we have the p-convexity versions of this. So, uh, with jointly with Hector Hardon, Nils Lausen, Vladimir Troitsky, and Mitchell Taylor, we proved that one can develop the theory of free Banach lattices under some convexity conditions. So, in the picture there, well, you could ask, and this is what uh, I think Enrique mentioned the other day in his in his in his exposition that. If, if, you, if you want to extend maps into p-convex spaces, for instance, you can also make it with the extra assumption that the object you get is p-convex, right? And one can do this also for spaces with upper p estimates or certain, certainly a more varied zoo of, of convexity conditions that you could, that you could uh, like to consider. And more recently, we also proved the complex version of it. So, so far, everything was about real scalars, Banach lattices and, and, and Banach spaces, but one can give a proper meaning to, to all this theory in the complex setting. Uh, so we chose that maybe this construction is robust enough to, to, to handle both the real and the complex version. And they're not exactly the same things, right? So, but some, some peculiarities of the complex version that are quite interesting. But anyway, so what I want to do in the remaining uh, half an hour or so is to speak about how this um, construction really uh, relates the Banach space E that you start with, with this Banach lattice. So as I said, how, how, how can you relate Banach space properties of some space to Banach lattice properties? Okay, so I think Enrique was calling this a dictionary, right? Uh, you could hope for some dictionary which tells you, well, if you have a Banach space with this and that property, then the free Banach lattice has this and this other property, and I can go back and forth, and that would be great because you could reduce uh, Banach space theory to Banach lattice theory, and I wouldn't mind that, but uh, maybe that's a bit uh, too ambitious. Let's see. Uh, well, first of all, um, well, we don't like functions maybe, but we have to be able to speak about 
if we speak about the way you associate a Banach lattice to a Banach space, we have to be uh, careful and, 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 and also we want to, 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 to describe how we associate a lattice homomorphism to a linear operator, a bound of linear operator. And this is done by just looking at the following diagram. So suppose uh, you start with a bounded linear operator between two Banach spaces, E and F. I'm going to look at these spaces sitting inside the corresponding free Banach lattices, right? So I have these two linear embeddings, delta sub E and delta sub F. And now, well, the universal property allows me to extend operators to lattice homomorphisms when I'm going to Banach lattices. So I just take the composition of this operator with this embedding, right? So this composition here from E to the free Banach lattice of F, it's a linear operator and I can extend it in a unique way to a lattice homomorphism making this commuted, right? So I'm using a different notation for, for this extension. I put a T bar uh, in the slide before I was using T hat. Okay, well, uh, that's because, well, these are essentially different things, but uh, coming from the same principle, okay? And this is the correspondence. So yeah, maybe you shouldn't look at this <laughs> at the moment, but sorry, I, I was not able to hide it, uh, apparently. So uh, how do you relate properties of this operator with properties of the extension, or well, the Banach lattice homomorphism extending T? Well, we could prove that, for instance, notions such injectivity or surjectivity behave very well. This is not completely obvious. Well, some of the implications are, but that they are equivalent. It's quite, uh, well, I would say surprising because in other categories, well, in other instances of free objects, you, you don't have this, okay? But here we have. So if you start with an injective map, the lifting, I mean, the, the extension, this lattice homomorphism will be injective. Okay, uh, the converse of that is trivial because yes, I'm saying E is sitting inside of T, so injectivity of this guy implies injectivity of this small one. But the other implication is less, uh, less, it's not straightforward at all. And similar thing happens with subjectivity, which as you know, in the Banach space situation, subjectivity is equivalent to, I mean, a subjective map is equivalent to a quotient map. And so in this situation you have uh, also that this construction is maybe stable under quotients if you want, okay? In both ways, actually, right? This is what this second line is saying. But motivated by this, one could argue, uh, okay, if you know what happens with quotients, maybe you should tell me what happens with subspaces, right? That's kind of a general thing. Uh, if you start with a, you suppose you start with a Banach space E sitting inside of F, right? How do you relate the free Banach lattice of E with the free Banach lattice of F? Well, uh, formally I have, well, I can, I, can, I can think of this inclusion as, a form, as an operator, as a formal operator, I will call it Yota. And well, that theorem is telling me that because this is injective, I can define this injective extension to a lattice homomorphism between FBL of E and FBL of F, right? Okay. And the question is, well, okay, this is injective, but uh, how is this distorting the norm? I mean, is this an embedding? Is this sub, is this uh, the free Banach lattice over the small subspace can be seen as a closed sublattice of the free Banach lattice of the larger Banach space, right? And well, it turns out that this is not always the case, uh, and, but one can prove precisely, one can give a, a characterization of when this happens. And this is related to a certain property of extension of operators, okay? So this is explicitly described in this theorem here. So if I have the property that uh, when I have a subspace E of F and I have the property that any linear operator from the small space E into finite dimensional L1 space has uh, an extension with, an not, with, with a certain control of the norm, right? Of course, because of Hambana, uh, every linear map will, 
will be extended to a map here, right? But uh, you want to control the norm of the, as an operator, the norm of the extension as an operator. And when you can do that in a uniform way, that means without any dependence on, on the dimension, then you can prove that the free Banach lattice of E embeds as a sub lattice of the free Banach lattice of F via this uh, in injection, okay? This lattice injection. And I mean, I haven't written it well, but actually this is, this is if and only if, right? So if, if this embedding is an, I mean, if this, sorry, if this map is actually an embedding, then you can have, the, you have this property of controlled extension of operators into L1. You could replace actually L1, finite dimensional L1 by any L1 space you like. But I mean, this is kind of nice. Okay. So far so good. Uh, okay, so this is the um, dictionary thing, or maybe the, uh, I would call this like a meta theorem or a dreamed meta theorem that uh, I would like to have, right? So I, I have, take your favorite Banach space property, and can you find a Banach lattice property which is completely analogous to that in this way, right? So that uh, my correspondence preserves these, these properties. And, well, I don't have a proof for this or a meta proof of this thing, but I can show you some examples where this happens. So for instance, simple examples, uh, Finite dimensional, which is certainly a Banach space property, can be characterized by the free Banach lattice having a strong unit. Okay, so an element which every every guy is dominated by some some multiple thing. Okay, and it's f and only f, as I said. I mean, all separability. It's another quite reasonable Banach space property. Has this natural analogous, which is having a quasi interior point. Right, saying that the ideal generated by a certain element is dense in the space. Okay, that's what I mean. Okay. And well, there are several other properties. Uh, I might spend some time. Uh, well, this mo more than a theorem should be an observation actually. Uh, well, what is this notion I'm writing here? So weakly compactly generated spaces or WCG are a class of Banach spaces which uh, in a certain way can be used to generalize or to prove things about th that work for separable spaces and for reflexive spaces. Uh, so of course, what is a weakly compactly generated space is just a space where you can find a weakly compact set whose linear span is dense in it, okay? Uh, so for instance, if you start with a reflexive space and you look at the unit ball, which as I said before, it's a, it's a weakly compact set, and everything is spanned by the unit ball. So, so reflexive spaces are always uh, weakly compactly generated. If I start with a separable space and I take a, a, a dense sequence in the ball, which I can because of separability, and I just put some weights in that sequence so that they converge to zero, then I get a compact set. And of course, the span of that will be again everything. Uh, and well, since we are looking at lattices, what one could also look at the analogous notion, which would be uh, weakly compactly generated as a lattice, meaning that I can find in my lattice some weakly compact set so that now it's not just the linear span which I look at, but I can also use the lattice operations, right? So that the, if you prefer, the smallest uh, closed sub lattice generated by that weakly compact set is the whole thing, right? Or if you prefer, that taking linear and lattice com combinations of, of, of points in this, um, in this weakly compact set, you get a dense thing. So you're allowed to use also the lattice operations. And actually it was a, it was a question uh, asked by Joe Distel whether these two notions were the same or not for, la for Banach lattices, right? Whether you start with a Banach lattice which is weakly compactly generated as a lattice, uh, can you prove whether it is also weakly compactly generated as a Banach space. So in other words, if I have a Banach lattice with some weakly compact set, which generates everything using the linear and the lattice operations, can I find maybe a different weakly compact set, which 
only with the linear operations, with the linear combinations, um, fills everything. And actually, this observation allowed us to provide a counterexample to oh, an example of a Banach lattice, which is weakly compactly generated as a lattice, but not as a Banach space, right? And the example was just the free Banach lattice of Hilbert space uh, on an uncountable index set, right? So one can prove that because, of course, this Hilbert space is reflexive. The free Banach lattice generated by this, it's lattice weakly compactly generated. And you just take the ball in here and you look at it sitting inside there and this spans, lattice spans everything. But you can actually find a copy of L1 of gamma as a subspace of this guy. And this uh, makes it impossible this, that, that this space is weakly compactly generated, okay? For, from, it follows from general theory of weak compactness. All right. Uh, so in this case, by the way, uh, we don't know about the converse. That's a uh, pretty, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> for me, it's an interesting question whether the converse holds. So one can prove that if you start with a, Banach, a free, I mean, with a Banach space whose free Banach lattice has this property, then uh, it's not completely crazy but to, to prove that then the Banach space must be a subspace of some weakly compactly generated. But this is not the same thing. Being a subspace of a weakly compactly generated space, uh, I mean, these spaces are not hereditary. There are examples of weakly compactly generated spaces containing subspaces which are not. So this is not enough, and we would like to know about the converse. Uh, okay. And another um, property we spent some time looking at is. Um, well, it's related to order continuity, right? Order continuity is maybe one of, well, maybe one of my favorite properties of the Banach lattice. So, of course, one cannot hope that free Banach lattices have um, an order continuous norm because, um, well, you have, you have, yeah, I mean, they, they, they have plenty of copies of C0 and actually spaces of continuous functions sit inside. So, I mean, there's no hope. I mean, they, they're never uh, order continuous for, for, for several reasons. They're not even uh, uh, data king complete or, I mean, yeah. I mean, this, this, there's some properties you cannot, you, you cannot expect for them, essentially because they are universal in some sense and, and well. But uh, anyway, so what one can try is look at what happens with the dual. And for that, we have some, some results. So, we could, we could characterize when the dual of the free Banach lattice is, is actually order continuous, right? And that is, uh, that is related to containing copies of L1, containing sub lattices or subspaces isomorphic to L1, or not containing them more precisely. So this is the theorem. Um, uh, we could prove that if you start, well, but, well, these two things are equivalent. If you start with a space which contains a complemented subspace isomorphic to L1, then um, this is the same as saying that the corresponding free Banach lattice contains a lattice complemented sub lattice. By that I mean that, the, well, it's a sub lattice isomorphic to L1, and I can find a projection which is a lattice homomorphism, okay? Which is slightly stronger. Well, it's, it's formally stronger. Actually, it's not because, uh, well, this is also the same as saying that the free Banach lattice contains a lattice complemented sub lattice isomorphic, not just to L1, but the whole free Banach lattice of L1. And, and this is the same as saying that it contains a sub lattice isomorphic to L1 or a quotient, lattice quotient. Okay. And yeah, for general Banach lattices, this, this property is well known to, to be equivalent to the dual failing the order continuity property. So, well, maybe as an example, uh, we could look at, so, so for instance, before, uh, well, no, no, how much time have I had? No, okay, yeah, so, yeah, one can, one can, one can look at 
a one sitting inside of the space of continuous functions in zero one as a subspace. Uh, so you could think of what happens with the, you look at this embedding from L1 to the space of continuous functions and you extend it to these, to the corresponding um, um, uh, lattice homomorphism. And well, because L1 is not complemented in, in the space of continuous functions in zero one, you cannot hope that operators from this L1 space extend to operators into C of zero one. So maybe, okay. Um, uh, let me go back to this theorem, okay? So imagine I, I'm going to apply this, this, well, I'm going to look at the situation when E is some L1 subspace sitting inside of the space of continuous functions in zero one, okay? And what I'm claiming is that, of course, um, if this property were true for, for, for this particular couple, so for L1 sitting inside of C of zero one, as I said, I could replace this by any, L1 space. So I could look, if you want, I could look at the identity operator or an isomorphism from A from, from, from E to L1. And if I could extend it, that would give me actually a projection on C01, a projection onto a subspace isomorphic to L1. But it is well known that, I mean, it's a, a consequence of uh, growth index uh, result that this is, this is impossible. So you don't have any complemented subspace um, in space of continuous function, which is isomorphic to L1 in, the, in, in, in C1. Uh, so this is telling me that when I look at this, um, this, this extension here for this particular choice uh, of, of, of embedding, the free Banach lattice of L1 uh, doesn't canonically embed as a, as a, as a sublattice of the free Banach lattice of, of C of zero 01. Well, I'm speaking about when I'm speaking, when I say it is a sublattice, what I mean here is that this extension here, the extension of the of the of the embedding I had, is actually uh, an embedding, right? So this is telling me that in the situation I'm looking at, it is impossible that uh, this extension uh, is an embedding. But one could hope that maybe the free Banach lattice of L1 can be embedded somewhere in a different way into the space of in the free Banach lattice of the space of continuous functions. And this theorem is, is, is ruling out this possibility, okay? Because of, yeah, I mean, it's just the characterization of this property. So conceptually it's much simpler, but maybe the way we arrived at it, it's kind of uh, more complicated. Well, anyway, uh, so maybe the last uh, result I want to mention, and uh, I will finish with it. It's uh, another property we, we could characterize, which is related to upper P estimates. Okay, uh, Banach lattice, it's said to have upper P estimates whenever uh, uh, this happens. So if you, there's some constant C uh, with the property that any pairwise disjoint uh, family of vectors, of disjoint vectors, when you compute the norm of the sum, you can, you have this upper estimate. You, you, you can compare it from above with the LP sum of the norms. Okay, uh, so of course, LP spaces will have an upper P estimate and a lower P estimate, which would be kind of the converse inequality. And I need to introduce uh, something which might look a bit, a bit awkward at the moment, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm, we, 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 we call an, an, a linear operator between Banach spaces uh, Q1 summing, okay? If, well, formally, if it maps uh, absolutely summable sequences or weakly summable sequences into strongly Q summable sequences, or you can rephrase this into such an inequality, okay? You have some constant, which, well, you denote by certain norm of this, of this, of this operator. You have some constant, which no matter which vectors you take on the space E, these are vectors uh, <coughs> XK, then, well, there's a T missing here, sorry. This would be an operator T acting in here. Uh, so the norm, the, the, the Q sum of the norm of T of XQ is controlled by this expression there, okay? Well, as I said, this might look weird, but actually for a Banach lattice, it is the same that a Banach lattice with has, has sub P estimates precisely when the identity operator on the dual Banach lattice has this property. 
where, well, and here P and Q would be Heller conjugates, okay? So what we could prove is the following uh, also uh, nice characterization. So if, if the identity on your Banach space has a, of the dual of the Banach space is Q and summing, then the free Banach lattice satisfies an upper P estimate and, and, and vice versa. Or if you want to look at from one to three, I mean, as I said, the equivalence between two and three holds for any Banach lattice, right? So what we're proving here is actually the equivalence between one and two, if you want, or one and three. So the identity, it's Q and on the dual is Q and summing, if and only if the identity on the dual of the free Banach lattice is also Q and summing. And yeah, okay. So maybe I will stop here. I want uh, to thank you for your attention. So, Arik, yeah, Yuri. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit of a general and provocative question. Uh, you said that if your meta dream theorem were true, then uh, the whole Banach space theory would follow from Banach lattice theory, so we wouldn't need any Banach space theory. But if it's an equivalent, so maybe the whole Banach lattice theory would follow from Banach space theory. And, and uh, Banach lattices are, of course, a class of, of, of Banach spaces. Yeah, I mean, it, it could actually, yeah, the kind of Meta theorem I was plotting there is uh, actually in both ways, right? That if you start with a Banach lattice property, then you would like to to have a Banach space analog. But at least that would work only for for free spaces. These are not only these are not, of course, the only Banach lattice we we know. So. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions um, regarding your uh, C of zero one embedding theorems. Uh, do you have any control on the constants? Like if you have a C linear embedding, then you get a two C or whatever lattice. Uh... Thank you. So it's, um, I think we cannot prove isometric. Uh, results, but uh, I think you you can control the constant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, second question. Um, so regarding your uh, uh, extending preserving injectivity and subjectivity, uh, so does it mean that if you start with a short exact sequence of Banach spaces, you get a short exact sequence of the FBL space is at least in some sense, or at least in the Banach space uh, setting? Yeah, you get it in the Banach space setting. But the problem is that um, when you make this sort of exact sequence, maybe. So you start with a Banach space uh, sort of exact sequence. Right, so you have say x, y, and z. Ah. Okay, it's okay. Can you see? Well, mm, okay. <laughs> so. So if you start with a, a sort of exact sequence of Banach spaces, right, you, you might want to, well, you just look at the corresponding free Banach lattices you get, right? And of course, um, what happens here is that, so this is telling me that the first thing is that, again, this extension, it's going to be injected, right? That would be first line on the theorem. Uh, of course, uh, this would be subjective, right? The only thing is that if, since these are lattice homomorphisms, 
the kernel of a lattice homomorphism is not just a sublattice, but an idea. And it's very strong that the image of this guy is an ideal here. Uh, I think this cannot happen, not even in the simplest uh, situation. Yeah. So I think it, no, no, I think you cannot embed this. And I think the image of this guy cannot be an ideal in here because, uh, unless it's everything. <laughs> Okay, last question. No, but so at least it tells you that uh, the thing in the middle will be, yeah, the the, the free banner lattice uh, so of the quotient will be at least in the banner space, meaning the quotient of the free banner lattice, but not. I mean, that can give you ex examples of things which are banner space isomorphic, but not lattice isomorphic. Right? Uh, did you have any thing that? Uh, <laughs> I haven't thought about this in detail, but 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 yeah, that should give you examples of this. But we, I mean, we have other sources of simple examples like Hilbert space or. Right. <laughs> uh, last question: uh, Any hope of proving towards reducing the theory of banner spaces to the theory of banner lattices that the construction that associates to a banner space, separable banner space X, the free banner lattice. Could be Borel in any setting. <laughs> should be. You think it should? Yeah, there's no. I mean, there's no reason to. To I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know. But I think it should be Borel, right? Because uh, it's something you define. Well, I don't know. Uh, no, no. I, I know yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you stay. You stay. Yeah. You. St you. St well. You. You. St you start with the. Um, Separable, of course, separable Banach spaces. And you look at the free Banach lattice generated by separable. And as I said, there is a universal, uh, there's already a universal separable Banach lattice. So you could put everything there. And then, of course, you can start talking about uh, Borel and complexity of this. But of course, I mean, your, your, your result about the, the Banach space. Um, not the problem about how, how complex is the Banach space isomorphisms uh, would I, I would I would fear that the same should happen for Banach lattices, right? That that, that you should have a, a similar uh, result, but this is totally guessing. I I don't know. Thank you very much. I have uh, one remark and uh, two questions. Uh, my first remark, I think that your talk is uh, a good example of application of category theory in functional analysis. You have two categories. You have the category of Banach space, and you have uh, the other category of, uh, of lattice, of Banach lattice. Uh, and you have a subcategory of Banach lattice, which is the free Banach lattice. And uh, I can, we can define the functor from the first category to the second. And all the questions that you ask here are to look to some property in the first category on object and uh, on, on morphism. And we look if uh, these properties are preserved by the functor. I think I can resume this. And you have in this diagram here, a good application of uh, this, this commutative diagram. We will use this in the category form, category theory. Yeah. I think we can formalize your talk uh, by using the language of category theory. My first question, if I, if I, 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 I take this uh, schema that I give you, you have the category of Banach lattice and the subcategory of free Banach lattice. What is the correspondent to free Banach lattice in Banach space? And I, I, I look. Okay, so, uh, well, the free Banach space would be L1. 
and one of a set. Yeah, that would be the free. But that depends what you mean by that. But, no, no, because of triangle inequality. Yeah, that's the only thing. Yeah. And, and maybe a comment about your comment. <laughs> so uh, we were actually this morning exactly discussing about this. And uh, well, I'm not sure this is a, a, an application of category theory to Banach lattices or to, to, to language. We are not using any result from category theory. And well, <laughs> Martin has the, the opinion that there are no <laughs> theorems <laughs> that one can directly use from category theory. I kind of agree. <laughs> well, that no, there's no, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe exaggerating a little bit, but uh, we were using Banach spaces and Banach lattices here. And I, I, I know I have examples in mind of, of, of theorems that work in this situation and have a similar state, analogous statement for other free objects. So there is this well-known object of Lipschitz free Banach spaces associated to a metric space. And actually this is a source of inspiration for many of the questions I was, I was discussing today. But uh, for instance, some of the results in, in about Lipschitz free Banach spaces, which have a certain analog in this situation, they, I think there's no hope of, of finding a, a common unified proof for all of them. That would be like a theorem from category theory that you could that you could directly use. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit skeptical about this being a, a real application of uh, category theory. But as you said, certainly the language is very powerful and very and very inspiring, and 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 you see the analogies. That's the good thing. Right? That's what uh, mathematicians uh, we do, right? You look for analogies, and and certainly this is a, a very clean uh, setting for, for, I mean, category theory is a very clean setting for, for looking for these analogies. What, what, what in the theory, uh, what we prove here, if you have a morphism which is injective in the first category, its image by the functor is injective in the second category. That is it. My second question, I, I return to page four, I think. No, where C0 and uh, no, no, before, before this page. No, no, no. You have C0, yes. Here, here, no. Yes. In the two first theorem, you speak about uh, the small C0 and the C01. And I observed that C0 and C01 are a separable uh, M space. Uh, is this here a relation between uh, space M space and the, the problem that you ask yeah. there? Yeah, I mean, the, the only spaces that can have this property are very easily seen to be AM spaces because, as I said, you start with a Banach lattice, separable, okay? Separable Banach lattice. You can put it inside the space of continuous functions of zero one as a linear subspace. So if you have this property, it must be a sub lattice of C of zero one. So it is an AM space. And in general, for without separability, you can also prove that they have to be AM spaces, yes. Thank you, Mr. Pedro, for your talk. Uh, for me, I, uh, I need to know the form of the maximal ideal FA, maximal ideal of the free Banach lattice, in which the, order, uh, the, the norm is order continuous. Can this we have be, this for This could be zero. Yes, because so, so for instance, in the finite dimensional situation, in the if you start with a finite dimensional Banach space, the free Banach lattice is just a, a renorming of the continuous functions on the unit sphere. So there's no 
or their continuous uh, things there, right? So then, Tetra, thank you very much. Ah, last. Too late. Thanks for a nice talk. So we have the lunch break. <laughs>